There's a TV show called Breaking Bad that's been really popular since it came out 16 years ago. It does have a lot of violence and difficult subject matter, but it also has a lot of lessons about consequences and character and morality. And one character on the show is called The Disappearer. He runs a vacuum repair shop, but his secret job is to make people disappear by creating a new identity for them. And whenever he creates a new identity for someone, he takes that person somewhere isolated, far away from where their old lives were. And part of the deal is they have to stay out of the public eye and not draw any attention to themselves. And that sort of seems like where the early Christians are at uh, the last time we saw them in the, the book of Acts last week. We're told that a young man named Saul was going door to door persecuting and arresting any Christians that he found. And all of the early believers except the disciples were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. But they didn't take on a different identity or try not to draw attention to themselves. Like we saw last week in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. We're told about a man named Philip who went to Samaria and preached the gospel. He and the other early followers of Jesus were witnesses of what they had seen and heard and come to experience for themselves. And even though they were displaced by the persecution in Jerusalem, they were going to tell other people what they knew to be true about Jesus. And as we look at Philip, we see something that is true today and, and was true back then. People all around us are searching for spiritual truth. It seems like wherever you look today, people are looking for spiritual meaning. I hear people say all the time, they are a spiritual person. But that spirituality can take all sorts of forms, and a lot of times it's just based on feelings. And that's partly because as people created in the image of God, there's a feeling, a sense that there is something more to life, something beyond the physical things that we see around us. People are looking for spiritual truth, but they don't have the full picture much of the time. And we see Philip's experience with someone who is seeking in Acts chapter 8. An angel comes to Philip, tells him to go to a certain road, and when he does, there's a chariot. So Philip runs up to the chariot and finds an Ethiopian eunuch. The man is an important official who has come to Jerusalem to seek God, and he's on his way home. Then here's what happens in Acts 8, 30 through 39. It says, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So this man had been seeking spiritual truth. We're told that he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He had the desire for the truth, but he didn't understand it. And so God led Philip to be at the right place so that he could explain to this man that the gospel was what he had been searching for. And if we have our minds and hearts set on the gospel, we are going to find ourselves in situations like that. I've never knowingly had an angel come to me and tell me where to go, and I've never been miraculously whisked away by the Holy Spirit, but I have found myself with opportunities to point people toward Jesus in some really unexpected situations. Once when I was just out of high school, a couple of friends and I drove up to Portland because one of my friends was wanting to buy a car and there was a huge car sale thing up at Portland Meadows. I drove up there and, and we looked around all afternoon, but my friend couldn't find a car that he wanted or that he could really afford anyway. So we headed back home, which was about an hour and a half drive. 
Then there was one of my friends in the front seat and another in the back. About halfway home, my friend in the back seat got quiet. And after a while, I looked in the rearview mirror and he was reading a Bible that had been laying in my back seat. I was surprised and I, I didn't want to interrupt him. But after a while, he started asking questions about what he was reading. And I wish that I could say that it was a situation like Philip and, and the Ethiopian man, but it didn't work out completely that way. I did get to tell him some things about Jesus, but I also partly missed my chance because I wasn't ready for it. And it made me realize that I will never know the time when, when the time's going to come for me to say a word for Jesus, and I don't want to be caught unprepared again. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I guarantee you that we are surrounded by people who are searching for spiritual truth. They're hungry for it, and, and there are plenty of people who are going to tell them all sorts of things that sound spiritual. But we have the actual truth about Jesus to share. And if we're not prepared when the, the opportunity comes along, we might miss our chance to share the gospel with someone who is seeking the truth. So we have to work at having our minds and our hearts set on the mission that Jesus has given us so that we don't miss those opportunities that Jesus is going to open up for us. Now, the conversation of the Ethiopian eunuch or the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch was really cool. But there's another conversion that's even more dramatic. And in Acts chapter 9, we see that Jesus can redeem anyone's life. The fact is, Jesus is the only one who can redeem anyone's life. We sometimes get the idea that we have to change someone or fix someone or, or save someone, when in reality, we may have influence on people, but Jesus is the only one who can completely transform a person and make them new. And there's, one, there's no one who's beyond his ability to save. And we see one of the most dramatic examples of that in Acts 9, 1 through 9. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell on the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Remember last week, one of our points was that we have a God who fights for us. Well, here we see how Jesus looks at us. Jesus took Saul's persecution of the church personally. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now for Saul, this was a seismic shift. He wasn't seeking spiritual truth like the Ethiopian man. Saul thought he already had it all figured out. He was basically an all-star in the Jewish ruling class. He was young, but he had all the credentials that would have made him a powerful leader among the teachers of the law. The New Testament tells us that Saul was from a long line of Pharisees, that he studied under the prominent rabbi Gamaliel. And later in life, he writes about some of his credentials in Ephesians 3, 4 through 6. He says, if anyone thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Basically, Saul had followed all the rules from the time he was an infant but when he had an encounter with Jesus, he realized that following the rules wasn't going to save him. He understood that he wasn't perfect. And when he grasped the fact that his only hope was in forgiveness through Jesus, he had a totally different view of his own righteousness. In Ephesians 3 verses 7 through 9, he says this about those accomplishments that we just read about. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Saul had a face-to-face encounter with Jesus, and all of Saul's rule following melted away in comparison with the holiness of Jesus. And after Jesus interrupted Saul's trip to Damascus here, he gave him some time to think about it. Three days, in fact. And I can't help but think that Jesus allowed Saul to be blind and in darkness for three days to drive home the fact that Jesus had been in the grave for three days, but that when he rose again, everything was different. And everything would be different for Saul now, too. And in what happens next, we see that often Jesus gives us scary assignments. Saul had been persecuting and arresting Christians in Jerusalem and in the whole region, and his mission was well known. At this point, Saul was in Damascus at the house of a man named Judas. But in that same town, there was a follower of Jesus named Ananias. And Jesus came to him in a vision, and he tells Ananias to go to where Saul is and to pray for his sight to return. And Ananias has the same reaction that a lot of us would have. In Acts 9, 13 through 16, it says, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Can you relate to Ananias here? I I know I can. First of all, he tries to tell Jesus something. He's like, I've heard about this guy, and for your information, he came here to arrest people who follow you, as if Jesus didn't already know that. And we have that same reaction too, don't we? When our comfort or our opinion and Jesus' truth bump into each other, we're tempted to say, well, Jesus, don't you know that this is what I think? Or this is what this person has done, or nobody else is doing that. And it can be scary when we know that Jesus is wanting us to be a witness for him. We worry about not having the answers. We worry about making ourselves look stupid. We worry about what it's going to require of us. But those things that we worry about are almost always self-centered. And when we have self-centered worries, we're not thinking about the needs of the people that God is calling us to. Yes, we might not have all the answers. Yes, we might look stupid at some point. Yes, we might be required to give a lot, but our obedience could also have an eternal impact on someone's life. And looking back at Ananias, the response he gets from Jesus doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room. Jesus just says, go. And then he does give Ananias a short explanation of what he's going to do through Saul. But in the next few verses, we see that It's how Jesus sees people that matters. And we have to do our best to see people the way that Jesus sees them. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we read the verse that says that we should no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. And in what happens next here, we see that Ananias understood that. After his hesitation about what Jesus told him, Ananias does go to Saul. And here's what it says in Acts 9, 17 through 19. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Ananias could have still kept his distance even while obeying. He could have said, okay, Saul, I know all the horrible things that you've done, and some of the people you arrested were my friends, so I don't trust you. But Jesus said I had to come here, so I'm here. But instead, Ananias says, brother Saul, Jesus sent me here for you. Now that word brother is the Greek word adelphos, and it's a word that means a brother in faith. It's the word Jesus used for his disciples. 
When Ananias uses this word for Saul, he's accepting him as a fellow brother in their faith in Jesus. And it obviously made an impact because here's the interesting thing. This word Adelphos is used 142 times in the New Testament after the book of Acts. And 139 of those, all but three, are in the letters that this man Saul wrote. He obviously deeply valued being accepted as a brother in the Christian faith. The people who had so much reason to hate him, the people who could have easily rejected him after all he'd done to their fellow believers, they were the ones who forgave him and called him brother. So in the matter of three days, Saul's world has been completely turned upside down. Everything had changed. And he demonstrated that by immediately being baptized. He hadn't eaten in three days, but he went first and was baptized and then he ate to regain his physical strength. And what he does after that is an example that when we choose to follow Jesus, our mission is to help others follow him too. You might think that Saul would have those same fears that we have, that he wouldn't have all the answers or that he would look stupid, especially after he had persecuted the church so harshly. But within just a few days, he started telling everyone that he could about what he had come to believe about Jesus. Here's what we see in Acts 9, 19 through 22. It says, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Saul didn't waste any time. It says there, at once he began to preach. And what was his message? That Jesus is the Son of God. That's the simple, life-changing message. Yes, Saul had all sorts of training in the law, but he had experienced something much more profound. He had met Jesus. And his mission now was to share that truth with anyone he possibly could. And that's how the gospel spread in Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout the world. People who had encountered Jesus helped others to encounter him too. Through commitment to the mission, even in scary assignments. And that's still how the gospel is spread today. Each of us who have experienced a life-changing encounter with Jesus have the mission of helping others to encounter him too. Years ago, my dad was in the hospital in Portland for a cancer procedure. He was a pastor for a long time, and he had lots of friends who were pastors. And several of them came to visit him one day, and they caught up, and they laughed together, and they talked about their faith, and they prayed together. And what my dad didn't realize was that the other man in that hospital room, in a bed on the other side of a curtain, was listening. That man was in his early 30s, and he also had cancer, and he was going to be sent to a hospice facility because there was nothing more the doctors could do. In the evening, when all was quiet, that young man pulled back the curtain and said to my dad, So you're a pastor, huh? Is all that stuff that you guys were talking about really true? So my dad got a Bible out of the drawer in the room, and he opened up to the book of Romans, a book that was written by that same man, Saul, who met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And my dad walked that man through the Roman road, a group of verses from Romans that lay out our need for a Savior and how Jesus is the only one who can save us. The man said that he believed the message and they prayed together that night. The next day, the young man was taken to the hospice facility. But a few weeks later, that man's sister got a hold of my dad and told him that her brother had been baptized after he left the hospital and that he had died a couple of weeks later. Being in the hospital fighting cancer was a scary assignment for my dad. But he was in the right place where he needed to be that day. And no matter what condition or situation he was in, his mission was the same as it had always been. The same mission that we have to point other people to the hope that we have found in an encounter and a relationship with Jesus. Because there are people all around us seeking spiritual truth. And Jesus wants to and will redeem anyone's life who comes to him. And we are his witnesses. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21 says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, 
not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the gospel that we have experienced in Christ. And that's the ministry and the message and the mission that each of us has had committed to us. So let's have our hearts and our minds set on being witnesses of what Jesus has done. And we will have the chance to help people have a life-changing encounter with Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for the truth. Thank you that we have truth to share. That we don't have to go based on our feelings or assumptions or hopes about what might be happening spiritually somewhere out there, but that we can know you and you can know us and we can have a relationship with you because of Jesus, that we can understand deep spiritual truth because we've seen it in Jesus, in the life that he lived, in the death that he died, in the resurrection that he uh, came out of the grave that he lives today, that your spirit lives within us, that we can live out spiritual truth. And we know that there's people all around us who are looking for that. They're hungering for it. They're they're searching for truth. So help us to find ways to tell them the truth, to help them to have an encounter with Jesus so that they can understand your deep love for them and that you sent Jesus to be the way for them back to you. We pray that the lives that we live and the things that we say and the the obedience that we have to your will and to your calling in our life and, and to the mission of the gospel would have an impact in this world and they would use our lives and, and whatever we can do for you to make a difference and, and to expand your kingdom and to change the lives of people around us. Thank you for how our lives have been changed and how each day you're shaping us more into the image of your son. And we pray in his name. Amen.